everyone. Welcome back to the lab. Today we've got the setup for Young's double slit experiment. On the left here, we've got a laser shining a red beam of light across the room towards the white sheet of paper on the chalkboard. And this white sheet of paper is going to be our viewing screen. You can see the red dot that we would expect from a laser, and we could use that ruler for some calculations later on. You can pick up the laser here for a couple dollars from a dollar store, and that could be the only expense if you have the other materials already. We're going to end up shining that laser on the nichrome wire here, and that's going to create a double slit. The light is going to pass on either side of this nichrome wire, which creates the distance between the two slits. And we can see its gauge is 34, corresponding to a diameter of 16 hundredths of a millimeter or 0.16 millimeters. Our double slit here is 150 centimeters from the screen. And I'll move it so that the laser is incident on the wire. And so you should be able to see a red dot on the wire showing the laser is passing around the wire on both sides as required for our double slit setup. Again, around 150 centimeters from the viewing screen. And if we turn off the lights and have a look at the screen, we can see the beautiful interference pattern that's created by the double slit setup. So using the ruler, we can, if we want, use the interference pattern to calculate the wavelength of the red light from the laser. And so why does this interference pattern occur? So here we have a simulation of Young's double slit experiment created using Desmos, the online graphing calculator. On the left here, we have our incoming light produced by the red laser used in the experiment and the light is represented by the graph of sinusoidal functions. That light is passing through the double slit here, and the distance between these two slits would be the width or diameter of the nichrome wire. Note that the light passing through the lower slit is represented in blue here, and that's just so that we can keep track of the light passing through the lower slit and the light that's passing through the upper slit. Uh, but all the light is produced by the same red laser, and so all the light uh, is actually coherent. Uh, coherent means it's going to have the same frequency and wavelength, uh, but also always be in phase. And so the light produced by a laser is always in phase, and we can see that uh, in that the light passing through the upper slit here is in phase with or is aligned with the light passing through the lower slit. For our simulation then, the light passes through the double slit and the bending of or diffraction of light occurs. And then the light is incident on the screen, which was the sheet of paper in the experiment. And so the simulation shows whether or not the light is in phase uh, or aligned at the screen. And so here the light is in phase, the light passing through the upper slit is in phase with the light passing through the lower slit, which we would expect uh, since this is the central maximum, which was that very, very bright spot in the experimental results. When the light passes through the slits, then it diffracts in all directions. And if I let the simulation run, it shows the interference, both constructive and destructive, at all points on the screen. Activating another feature, the simu simulator creates a circle that shows the relative intensity of the light viewed in the interference pattern. And so we have the brightest point at the central maximum there. Uh, which we just observed, and uh, we can see that the alternating bright and dark fringes uh, or alternating uh, maxima and minima, just as we observed in the lab. And so the intensity gets brighter the closer and closer you get to the central maximum here. Uh, if we reset to the central maximum, and we'll run the simulation again, uh, then we can count the number of maxima uh, as they occur. And so here we can see there's a minima, and then there's our first maximum. As it continues running, another minima, and our second maximum. If we zoom in on that point, we can see that there's indeed 
constructive interference there. Uh, the light passing through the upper slit and the light passing through the lower slit, they're in phase or aligned with each other. And so we have constructive interference resulting in a maximum. And we're going to analyze uh, this point uh, in a little bit. If we continue to let the simulation run, though, then we'll find the next minimum. So as it runs, then right about there, uh, we have a minimum. And so let's zoom in. And we can see that that minimum occurs when the light is out of phase, and not just out of phase, uh, but actually a whole half wavelength out of phase, causing it to uh, perfectly cancel and resulting in a dark spot or a minima or a uh, dark fringe that we saw in the lab. And so what are the conditions uh, that are required and how can, how can we describe uh, or determine when maxima or minima will occur? So if we return to that second uh, maxima from the central maximum, uh, then we're going to uh, take a picture of this and analyze this. So I saved the picture from the simulator. And I'll also include our lab results, uh, just to remind us that we're looking at the second maximum from the central maximum. And a common way of labeling these uh, would be the central maximum is the m equals zero maximum. We can see it's extremely bright. The intensity is very high. And then we have our m equals one, or the first maximum from the central maximum. And then we have our m equals two maximum, or bright fringe, uh, which is the second maximum from the central maximum. And we can continue that pattern in both directions. So everything's with respect to the central maximum. Uh, now we saw with the simu simulator that the light passing through the upper slit and the light passing through the lower slit is in phase when it's incident on the screen here, resulting in this maximum that we could see. And so the question is, uh, what are the conditions required for that maximum to occur? Uh, so we know that the light needs to be in phase or aligned uh, with each other. Uh, but what conditions result in that maximum occurring? And so one thing that we can look at is the path difference, uh, where we can compare uh, the uh, difference in the distance traveled by the light passing through the upper slit to this point on the screen with respect to the distance traveled by the light that passes through the lower slit to this point on the screen. And so I'll just draw a straight line from the upper slit to the screen. And so that line is the distance that the light passing through the upper slit uh, now needs to travel to reach that point on the screen. If I move that line, and I'm only moving it, uh, I'm not changing its length or anything, I am going to rotate it though, so that's it. So that it's in line with the light passing through the lower slit, and I'll just move it to make sure that the end of it's uh, also on the screen. And what we can see is that the light passing through the lower slit uh, travels the same distance as the light passing through the upper slit and some extra since this is not uh, covered. And so this distance here is the path difference. And if we zoom in on that, uh, then we can count the number of wavelengths within that path difference. And so I'll just sketch over them. So starting at this point here, then we have one full wavelength and continuing, we have two 
full wavelengths. And so the path difference in this case is two wavelengths. So two wavelengths or two lambda. And how does that correspond? With respect to our interference pattern, well, the path difference is two wavelengths, and that corresponds to the m equals two bright fringe or maximum. And so that relationship is always going to be true for the m equals one maximum, then the path difference is gonna be one wavelength. And for the m equals three maximum, the path difference is three wavelengths. Uh, and for the m equals zero central maximum, uh, then the distance traveled uh, by the light passing through the upper slit and the light passing through the lower slit is going to be the same. And so the path difference is zero or zero wavelengths. And so in conclusion for Young's double slit experiment, the maxima occur when the path difference is an integer number of wavelengths.